All right, good morning, Lake Point. Good morning, good morning. We're glad you're here. Hi, David. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, thanks, David. Welcome to Lake Point. We're glad you're here. If you're still trickling in, come on in. Glad you made it here as we're wrapping up our summer. We're gonna start with our worship this morning by singing Our God together. So let's stand so we begin our worship together. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine and you can have a seat. And here's Pastor Dean. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. I got a couple announcements for you about things that are coming up. First of all, tonight is our annual church picnic and baptism. It's out at the McHugh's house. You see the address there, write it down so you can find it. Uh, they got a pool so the kids can swim. It's a potluck, so bring a dish to pass. Uh, we're going to eat at 5. The baptism would be at 6. We're baptizing six people, uh, three people uh, at 6 o'clock. Um, I hear that it's a wet out there, so the grass is a little wet. You might want to wear sandals or shoes you can mess up or boots or something. Um, all right, anything else I'm supposed to say about the picnic? All right, um, go to the next slide, if you would. Uh, uh, next Sunday is... Uh, Labor Day Sunday. And so we always take Labor Day to talk about our work, how to honor God with our work at our jobs. So there's not going to be a regular sermon next Sunday. We're actually going to hear from six of our people. Six of you are going to just share how you try to be a Christian at your job. And so uh, be here next Sunday. It's going to be a, a really helpful 
Sunday to be uh, together. Our next slide, I want to remind you about this laundromat outreach we're doing at the Coinomatic on Grand River Drive in Detroit. It's Saturday, September 9th from 1 to 4. I hope you'll put that on your calendar. We're just going to be there. We're going to give people money, laundry, detergent, and uh, those little dryer sheets. And then we're going to try to talk to them about the Lord, just make some contact. So if you would put that on your schedule, you don't have to come for the whole time, come for any part of that. And uh, next slide, our Awana is about to start. It's our kids' club. Jamie Yonker's in charge of that, so he's going to come and tell us a little bit about uh, how it's going to work and some needs that they might have. Good morning. So, yeah, we got Awana starting up again. Um, I think Terry and I have been doing, what, 12 years or something like that? Well, yeah. We've been involved in it in a long time. Our kids are out of the program, but we still come because, you know, we're kids anyway. So, but Awana starting uh, with, on September 11th, we're going to have Awana Fest. It's a fest, you know, so you can be smiling and happy and stuff like that, right? Anyway, so anyway, Awana Fest we're going to have on September 11th, we'll have games and food and uh, just plain fun. And then I'll have a short parents meeting that we'll do as well. Uh, just to, you know, get the parents wrangled into what they got to do and stuff like that, right? So um, that's September 11th, and then our regular night starts on September 18th. Um, and just so you know, uh, one is for any kids kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, we have three different uh, sections, Cubbies, uh, Sparks, and TNT. They're divvied up between those uh, age, age ranges. And we study the Bible every week. They memorize scripture uh, in the TNT group. I also do some apologetics training as well. Um, and just, it's a great time. It's mostly once every Monday. Uh, we do give our volunteers some day, some weeks off here and there too. So it's generally three out of four uh, weeks per month. Uh, runs through until the beginning of May. And uh, I think that's all. Come and talk to me. No, wait. I don't want them to come talk to me. <laughs> yeah, okay, you can come talk to me if you're interested. Uh, bring your kids, and um, again, September 11th. All right, thanks, Jamie. We appreciate 6 you. 6 p.m. it starts on Monday nights. And we have a small group that meets in the building during that time, too. Uh, we have a real life minute. Uh, a real life minute is just when someone shares what God's teaching them or what God's doing in their life. Uh, Nathan Meyer is going to come. Nathan. Come on up here. Nathan loves to speak in front of people. <laughs> Be kind to him. I love it so much. Um, all right. Hey, guys. I'm Nathan Meyer. Um, for those of you that don't know, I've been uh, at UPPC for the past 10 weeks, serving on staff there. Just want to spend a minute uh, talking about what it was that I did and then a uh, small learning that I had. Um, so for the first four weeks I was up there, I was up there as a regular summer staff intern. And when you're on summer staff, you do things like the ropes course, the rock wall, you know, helping kids with programming, uh, just being there for whatever needs to be done, uh, roofing roofs, painting buildings, mowing the lawn, uh, just general maintenance, things like that. Um, and then the second half of the summer, the second four or five weeks, I switched over to being a maintenance intern. So I worked with Chad, the maintenance manager up there, and that was more like annual things that needed to be done. Like we had to bush hog all of everything to keep, keep the woods at bay or have to keep checks on our boiler, boilers and septics and all that fun stuff that you'd never see if, you, if you're not in it. Um, so that's kind of what I did. Um, a small learning that I wanted to share with you guys is at the very beginning of the summer during this uh, small half week called prayer camp, uh, their speaker was talking about um, glorifying God and how we glorify God. And he brought up the saying that used to be popular, what would Jesus do? Uh, whenever you're making a tough decision or something that you're not sure about, we, there used to be a saying, what would Jesus do? Um, but the speaker brought up the point, like, I'm not Jesus. I don't know about any of you, but I don't think any of you are Jesus either. I'm not necessarily going to do what Jesus would do because I'm not perfect. But he brought up another point. May God be glorified. And it's to think, would God be glorified 
by taking this choice, by doing this thing. And it's also a challenge uh, for, for me personally in my work and what I'm doing. Am I doing this to glorify God or myself? Am I doing this so that attention would be brought to me or so that God would be glorified and lifted up higher? And that's just a challenge that I want to leave with all of you and something that's helped me in the past few months. Would God be glorified in my life? Thank you. All right, thank you, Nathan. Wasn't so bad talking in front, oh, talking in front of everybody, right? All right, cover yours. This might be loud for a second. Okay. All right. We're going to continue in our worship. So would you stand as we just kind of quiet our hearts, connect with the Lord here. Sing, give me faith. my 
my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid in the veil. each promise of his word when winter fades i know spring will come the lord is my salvation in times of waiting times of need when i know lost when i See? 
to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. come before you this morning just wanting you to be glorified. Uh, God, we pray that our hearts will be shaped in a way that brings glory only to you, Lord. You are the author of salvation. You are our salvation, God. You are the almighty king, and we just want you to be glorified this morning. So give us open hearts and open ears this morning, Lord, as we, we try to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All summer we've been asking this question, what do the Old Testament prophets have to say to us today? And uh, we spent 15 Sundays on this now, and today is the last Sunday when we're talking about the Old Testament prophets. 
And uh, I think it's been a good series. We have learned so much, and I really feel like it's affected our behavior as individuals and our behavior as a church. We're actually doing some things now in response to what we've learned from the prophets, and um, I'm so pleased with that for us uh, as a church here at Lake Point. Um, so uh, today, though, we have a guest speaker. He's going to take the last. Uh, he's going to take Haggai, who is one of the post-exilic prophets. This is a prophet that uh, ministered in, in Israel after the people returned from the, uh, the exile. And uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, our speaker today is Mike Holloway. He's a pastor at a new church plant. It's called Walking on Water Bible Church. And they just started in November of 2022. So that's uh, less than a year old. Uh, he's married to his wife, Belinda, who's here with us. Welcome. They've been married 29 years. They have three sons. Mike says he loves apologetics, preaching, and teaching. Well, here's your chance. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Good morning and praise the Lord, everybody. Man, God is good, uh, worthy to be praised. We're certainly grateful to be back with you again. I think this is my third time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, being back here. And we always enjoy ourselves uh, when we come and visit and share with you all. This is an amazing church. Certainly, we thank God for your pastor, Pastor Dean, his wonderful wife and family in this amazing church, my good friend, uh, Brother Chris Samuel. God bless you. And we're just excited to be here. Thank you all for the praise and worship setting, what we call the atmosphere for the word of the Lord to go forth. We come for a word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And the word of God uh, is powerful. And certainly this lesson today, I think, is, is so good. Uh, and Pastor shared that you all have been going through the Old Testament prophets. And I think that's amazing. Those are some of the books that if we're not careful, we'll skip right over <laughs> and go right to the Gospels, which are good. And we'll go right to other books. But those Old Testament prophets carry so much uh, power in their words and in their writings. And they provide for us the his history of Israel and how God deals with his people. And how many of you know, God does not change. <laughs> Amen. He said, I am the Lord and I change not. And so it's always good when we go into the word of the Lord to see how God has interacted historically with his people. All right. And so this lesson, again, in this uh, powerful book of, of Haggai is a wonderful lesson. Haggai is a small book. Two chapters only, two chapters, but within those two chapters, there's so much meat, as I like to call it, so much weight. Haggai uh, presents, and you can uh, go, oh, I, I guess I'm supposed to be doing this, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right, let me get it on mine because I, oh, I guess I can look back here. Israel is returning to their land, having been taken captive by Babylon under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar. Israel, as you all know, were God's chosen elect people in the Old Testament, and Israel did not always do what God called them to do. Israel was often disobedient to God. Sound familiar, anybody? <laughs> Israel did not always obey God's commands. And God told Israel, what would happen if you obeyed my commands? God told Israel, what would happen if you disobeyed my command? In the book of Deuteronomy, God said, if you disobey me, he said, I will excommunicate you out of the land that I have given you, that I have blessed you to come into. And so God Blessed Israel when they did well, but Israel, time after time, they disobeyed God, and they didn't do what God called them to do. So they went into captivity. Uh, they were in Babylon for approximately uh, 70 years, but that exile ended with the rise of the Persian king led by Cyrus the Great. Right. So God allowed that captivity to end because God promised that he would bring Israel back into the land. So it was actually God who and he, he prophesied this well before King Cyrus came into be in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. God speaks prophetically, he says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd 
and will accomplish all that I please, he will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And to the temple, let its foundations be laid. So God promised that though I bring destruction, I am going to restore you, Israel. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> Scripture tells us that his anger uh, endures but for a moment. He's not a God that will bring about ultimate devastation without opportunity for repentance and restoration. He says in Isaiah 45 there, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or reward, says the Almighty. So what we have here is God promising Israel that though I bring the judgment, I will bring restoration. And so that leads us to where we are here in the book of Haggai. And I'll just read down here some of the passages in the book of Haggai, starting at verse number one, and we'll just read down some. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house, the Lord's house. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect it much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. So we're talking about building the house of God, building the house of God. The word of the Lord that came through Haggai was a word of instruction because through King Cyrus, Israel had already been in the land for some years, and they started out well. They built the foundations. They started doing what God had called them to do. God did just what he said he would do. He raised up King Cyrus. And the beautiful thing about it is Cyrus financed the building of the house of God, which is an amazing thing. Here, God uses Israel's enemy, as it were. They were in bondage or captivity to this nation. But God allowed this king, Cyrus, he touched his heart and said that I'm going to allow you to build the temple. And we read about this in the book of Ezra and in the book of Nehemiah. God tells them that I'm going to allow you. They sent priests, uh, they sent soldiers, they sent finances to assist Israel in rebuilding the temple of God and rebuilding the walls and the foundation. And Israel started out good doing what God had called them to do. But all of a sudden, they ran into some trouble. The Samaritans rose up against them, and they had some opposition in doing what God called them to do. <laughs> and sometimes, if we're not careful, we can assume that opposition means that maybe this isn't God. <laughs> maybe... I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe I should bring this thing to a close. As Pastor Dean 
talked about uh, we started a church plant in November, and God knows I've had a few of those. Maybe <laughs> this isn't what God had called us to do because sometimes opposition brings about doubt in our mind. And so ultimately, this opposition that Israel faced caused them to stop building the house of God. He stopped the work of God. But Haggai says to them, and notice what he does here. He addresses the leaders first. God is a God of order. And it's so vitally important that leaders stand and do what God have called them to do. Because sometimes, and actually most times, as the leader goes, so goes the people. Even when we study the history of Israel, when Israel had a good king that came in and did the will of God, you find the people lining up with what God called them to do. But then when Israel had a wicked king <laughs> that would erect places of worship for false gods, then the people themselves would follow the directions of the leader. So good leadership is important. If you have a church and you all do with the wonderful leader, you ought to thank God. Hallelujah. Because I listen, I've been in some places where the leader is more concerned about their own agenda than the agenda of God. And so even the leaders, and this is what God is doing. So Haggai first, he says, I got to address you leaders. He addresses them. And then he says, these people, <laughs> these people rather than my people. See, all throughout the scriptures in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, when the temple was built by Solomon, God said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, I'll heal their land. But Haggai now addresses them as these people. And what this shows is that there's a disconnect now between the people and God. Because this disconnect was brought about because the people failed. They stopped doing the work of God. And we never want to get to the place where there's a, a disconnect with God. I tell my young people at church, and I was a youth pastor for, for years at my previous church, I always tell them that the worst place to be is out of relationship with God. Make sure that your relationship with God is intact and that it's always your priority. It's always the thing that you put above all other things. Well, God says these people, and this, again, shows the disconnect there. Haggai 1 verse 4, he goes on to tell them. He says that you say, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? while this house lies in ruins? Now, this is interesting. He said, you are dwelling. You made sure that your house was beautiful. <laughs> you made sure that your house was intact. You made sure that your house had everything it needed. Notice he uses the term uh, paneled houses. The people focused on their own personal comforts and they neglected God's house. They neglected the things of God. They were focused on their own visions and on their own dreams. And they neglected what they were sent to do. Remember, we read the scriptures where Cyrus sent them back, financed the to build the house of God, to build the temple. They started well, but then they slacked off. And they focused more on their own vision, on their own house. Notice, opposition didn't stop them from putting up their own paneled walls. The paneled houses suggest that their homes were roofed with costly wood. So, so they put great emphasis, great emphasis on their own buildings, right? The house of God, though there was a, a limited amount of work that was done, enough to have service, <laughs> enough to maybe offer up some sacrifices, but it wasn't complete. But they were satisfied with the way it was to the point they ceased to work. The people placed a higher priority on their own homes than the house of God. What they had done was deplorable. What they had done was fruitless. Whenever we put things before God, 
Whenever we allow, we allow things to come to hinder the work that God have called us to do, it's not good. Not good at all. When we do that, there's going to be some consequences. Israel, Haggai 1 verse 5, he said, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought. I like this. <laughs> Give careful thought to your ways. In other words, think about what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. The people needed to reappraise their priorities. How many of you know that that's often good for us to do? Reappraise our priorities. Times where we have to sit back. I have one of my sons, thank God, I've got three uh, awesome sons. And, and one of my sons and going off to school. He's not here. And so I can... Use him as, I won't tell you which one. <laughs> one of my sons had gone off to school and was doing well at first. He was going to Central Michigan. And he got this, you know, you know how young people, it's easy to get distracted. And there are times where you have to bring him in. I said, son, <laughs> consider your ways. Because your, what you have allowed to distract you is going to bring about some consequences. Some are some consequences that, that are not going to work in your favor. God tells Israel, consider your ways. Give careful thought to what you're doing. Reappraise your priorities. We are called to examine our motives in everything we do. And this isn't an easy thing to do all the time. I mean, in everything we do, thank God for Brother Nathan and sharing that powerful testimony because he says something so powerful that I think ties right in hand with the message on today. What am I doing and will what I do now glorify God? Is this more to glorify me? Is this more to put myself on a pinnacle while God remains at a lesser position? Help me, God, in whatever we do to glorify you. Israel had to do this. And notice the consequences of Israel's lack of their wrong, misguided priorities. Now, they were working, <laughs> but they were working in the wrong way and doing the wrong thing. I mean, no, you can be busy doing the wrong thing. You can, you can have so much going on in your life. And, and, and from a personal standpoint, oftentimes, you know, we'll stick our chest out as though, look at all I'm accomplishing. Look at all of what I'm doing. But it doesn't mean that you're doing what God called you to do. And that's what we have to consider. He tells them, you have planted much. But here's the issue. You've harvested little. Now, that doesn't make sense. Because the, the process of sowing and reaping is that when you sow, uh, 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 you reap. Thank you. Somebody helping me out. There. <laughs> right? When you sow much, what's, what's the principle there? You're supposed to reap much. But what happened here? You're planting a whole lot. There's a lot of planting going on, but you're harvesting little See, there's another scripture that says that if except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman wakes but in vain. See, what we have to ask, God, uh, uh, are you in my plans? All that I'm doing, all of my efforts, all the things that I'm expressing uh, that I feel are good things. And you can think that they're good things. Is God being glorified in what we do? You eat. <laughs> you're always eating. I know about that. But you never have enough. There's, there's, there's something you're still hungry. That doesn't make sense. You're eating, but you're not full. You drink, but you never have your feel. You're still thirsty. You put on clothes. You're, you're putting on clothes, but you're, you're not warm. Now, this is the one here. <laughs> you earn wages. 
only to put them in a purse with holes in it. <laughs> Making all this money. Still, you know, and I, I've had to ask myself that several times. <laughs> Anybody ever asked, where's my money going? <laughs> Israel, you're putting it in a purse with holes in it. You should have. You should have a, a lot in the bank, but you don't. There is something wrong whenever we don't prioritize the things of God, there's something wrong. And sometimes we want God to bless our endeavors when we won't prioritize his purposes. One thing I learned about God and evermore learning that God doesn't compromise to please us. He doesn't do it. <laughs> we have to submit to God. He's not going to come down, okay, Mike, I know I wanted you to do this, but okay. No, no, he's not going to do that. But what I must do is say, Lord, I surrender to do the things that you have called me to do. Right here, and I just put a few scriptures on the screen about the dangers of, of complacency. Again, remember, uh, and these are scriptures about the sluggard and scriptures about those that are, are lazy. But, but it wasn't that they weren't working, but they were slowful in spiritual matters. Notice Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing. See, this is what Haggai told them. You, 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 you're reaping little. You crave, but you're reaping nothing. It's not that you aren't working, but you're not working in the right way. You're not working in the right area. You're not doing the right things. We must ask ourselves, God, am I doing the right things? I know I'm doing good things. There are times in my life where I've been busy doing a lot of good things, but they weren't necessarily the God things. We got to pray, God, help me to do the God things, not just the good things. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. And not men. So even in all my efforts, even naturally, I want, I want to do it with a mentality that God be glorified. Second Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So what this is, God is establishing a principle, these natural principles, that if you don't work, you don't eat. From a spiritual standpoint, if we don't work and do the things of God, we can't expect the blessings of God to overtake us. And Israel experienced this firsthand. Experienced it firsthand. They knew something was wrong. We should have more. We should be uh, uh, prospering more, but we're not prospering like we should be prospering. And so this is why the prophet encouraged them, think about what you're doing, right? I want you to consider your ways. The lack of desire to build God's house reflected the spiritual condition of the people because their focus wasn't on the things of God. The people had a focus on their own agenda more so than the things of God. That's really the heart of what was going on in the book of Haggai. A lack of focus on God. Lack of desire. And, and what happens in that lack of desire, and thank God, he's such a good and merciful God. Because he sends the prophet. <laughs> God could allow us to continue to walk off track. He told us once, we don't do it. He could allow us to just end in utter destruction, but he always raises up someone who will come and share a word to help get us back to where we need to be. Even reading this lesson uh, and studying for it myself, you know, they're, they're, they're always reminders. They're always those things to help to put things back in perspective for us to say, maybe I need to examine some things that I'm doing. I don't want to have a lack of spirituality. I want to do what God has called me to do. All right? Call to action. So here it is. Israel had fallen short of doing what God called them to do. Israel started out well, but allowed the trouble in their life to hinder them. 
to the point where they said, well, it's not time to build now. Let's just focus on us. Prophet warns the people, doesn't just tell them, he warns them. But thank God that with warning comes instruction. How many of you know that we need instructions? Haggai 2 verse 4, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Notice he talks to the leader once again. He says, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, Jonah, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all the people of the land, declares the Lord. Then he says, work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Thank God for this verse right here. This verse shows the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. Though Israel messed up, though Israel's priorities were in the wrong place, though they ceased from doing the word of God, God still says, I am with you. Thank God for his mercy. And he doesn't leave us when we mess up. He helps us to get it right and get back together. But notice, notice what he says here. He doesn't allow us to stay there. He says, now it's time for you to get up and work. Don't allow your challenges to hinder you from the work of God. Yes, I know, uh, notice uh, Israel, that the other nations will try to hinder you. Listen, when we're doing the work of God, when you're doing the work of God, everybody's not going to like you. <laughs> One of the first things my pastor shared with me when I, when I went to him and, and I told him that I felt that God was, you know, calling to me to preach and minister, he looked right at me and said, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and sometimes I look at myself in the mirror, do I'm sure I want to do this? <laughs> Because when you really are doing it God's way and you're really giving the people what God has to say, you're not trying to entertain them. You're not trying to tickle their ears. You really want them to know God and, then, and know God the way the Bible wants us to know God. Not everybody's going to like you. You're going to go up against some opposition. So sometimes, you all, when you face opposition in your daily tasks, when you're serving the God, it's not that God doesn't want you to do it. That could be confirmation that this must be what God wants me to do. <laughs> Because it's not easy. There are going to be some tests. Jesus said, in this life, you shall have tribulation. But then he goes on to say, but be of good comfort, for I have overcome the world. With Christ, you all, we can overcome. During Haggai's time, there were challenges and opposition to the temple's reconstruction. We similarly uh, encounter obstacles in our walk of faith and ministry in the New Testament church. However, we are reminded that God's presence and empowerment, with God's presence and empowerment, we can overcome adversity. We overcome, church. We overcome. We, with the help of God and by his Holy Spirit, we're able to overcome the works of the enemy. The latter glory of this house. See, one of the problems that Israel faced is as they began to build, and you'll read this throughout the account of Ezra, and Nehemiah, when they started to build, many of them were sad because when they compared that house with the house that Solomon built, it didn't compare in glory. Solomon's temple was so much more glorious. So the Bible tells us many of them began to weep and cry because they remembered the splendor and the glory of the previous house. But God encourages the people. He says that the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. God was establishing a, prince, a spiritual principle here. He says, I will give peace, declares the Lord. God says that, yes, uh, uh, maybe from a natural standpoint, this house doesn't compare, but there's a future glory that's coming. There's a future peace that's coming. The significance of the temple as a place of, is a, a, a place of worship and encounter with God. See, so the temple was the place where God decided where his spirit would abide which is why it was so bad for the people to, to cease doing the work of God because the temple was the place where God says, I will meet you here. And when there's not an emphasis on being in the presence of God, on being with the people of God, on worshiping God, there's a problem spiritually. The house of God represents the place God chooses to dwell to receive sacrifices. The church... Can you say the church? The church as God's house. First Corinthians chapter number three. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells where? In you. 
if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. See, the emphasis on the natural building of the temple in the Old Testament where God showed that this is the place I want to dwell. Now we're being instructed in the New Testament church that guess where God dwells now? He dwells among us. He dwells in us. And so now we as God's temple have to emphasize the, the spiritual matters that will help us to grow in the things of God. We've done that today because we've gathered together in the house of God to receive the word of God. What are we doing? We are seeing to the things of the temple of God. Why? Because we collectively make up the temple of God. Peter called us living stones in the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he says, or do you not know that your body your body is the temple of God. Remember, the temple of God was sacred. It was set apart for only spiritual services. We are set apart as the temple of God to only glorify God. Everything we do, we all glorify God. And so now the emphasis has to be placed on our relationship, personal as well as collectively, with pleasing God and doing what God have called us to do. As I bring it to a close, I encourage you, church, that we as the body of Christ, we must prioritize spiritual matters. And what do I mean spiritual matters? Biblical matters. In other words, we must prioritize the word of God. We must prioritize the things that God have called us to do. We must prioritize the house of God, the fellowship with the people of God. I'm so encouraged about you all are baptizing three souls. You know what that's doing? You're, you're prioritizing the things of God. It's so amazing because just on last week, we at Walking on Water Bible Church baptized three souls as well. And so this is how we prioritize the things of God when we preach the gospel and the temple, which we are, is being built as souls are coming into the kingdom of God. We should be obedient to God's directions. I told him at church last week that if we really don't want to follow directions, we don't want to be saved because it's only in following God's directions that we overcome. How many of you know God knows better than us? And we want to prioritize that and we want to follow his directions. We must be sincere and have wholehearted devotion with God. And that's not just on Sundays. Thank God for the devotion today. But our devotion from Sunday should carry us through Monday. And we should worship him on Tuesday, Wednesday, every day of the week. We must give wholehearted devotion to God. We must desire God's presence in everything that we do. That God be with us. Let your prayer. How do, how do you know? Somebody asked a question. How do you know whether God is with me? How do you know that his presence is there? Well, number one, you are the temple and he promised he'll never leave you nor forsake you. His presence is with you all the way. And then when you're doing it God's way, he's present. The realness of his presence becomes a reality. We ought to encourage one another daily to do what God called us to do. And finally, repentance and renewal. We go on and read throughout the book of Haggai, you find that Israel turned around. They went, they started cutting down trees, and they got back to doing the things of God and building the temple of God. God warned them, they, they repented. God was with them. He restored them, and they built the temple of God, and God was glorified. Church of God, let us prioritize the spiritual matters. Let us prioritize the things of God. Let us put God first. Let us, in all we do, right? My job, thank God he's blessed me uh, to work. I've worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield for over 30 years, but God is greater, <laughs> and I want to prioritize the things of God. The church of God comes before that. The church of God comes before all things, and that's what we have to keep in mind, church of God. God bless you. We trust and pray something was said to encourage your hearts on this morning. All right, thank you for that good word. We're going to close out our worship service this morning. We're going to sing How Great Is Our God, a chance to respond here. So let's stand and sing together. The splendor of our King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice
good word that's been brought to us this morning and we pray that it will be our desire to to prioritize you lord because you are worthy of it because we know that uh when we put you second or have you as an afterthought it it doesn't lead to to a joyful satisfying life lord so we just pray for that your spirit would overcome us with that and and that we will will want to prioritize you lord we thank you for uh, the body that we have here lord and we love you in jesus name amen